Uh, right, OK, this really will have to be a whistle-stop tour, but what, I, what I've done, there's some really good talks this morning, I've enjoyed it, and what I have been doing is starting to notice links with some of the things you guys have said and some of the things I'm going to be talking about later. So by way of background, my name's Mike, I'm an ecologist, so we've got that out of the way. I, I work as a technical director at SLR Consulting, we're a team of over 30 ecologists across the UK, I'm also um, a graduate of this place, um, when it was a, a little bit more modest, uh, 25 years ago, hard to believe, and I'm now an honorary senior fellow. So, here we go. SLR, really quickly, we're a multidisciplinary environmental consultancy. We do shed loads of stuff and support for built development, minerals, companies, energy, all sorts of stuff. Not going to go into it because we've got leaflets down there. Pick one up, have a look, have a look at the website. <coughs> Catch me later. We can talk about that on the, uh, the trips. Bit of showing off. You may recognise this. University of Northumberland. We did the design work. I won't linger on it because uh, there's not much biodiversity. I believe that's AstroTurf. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get the mowers up there. And interestingly, these things are to stop skateboarders. But uh, we did get an awful lot of awards for that, so, you know, it's part and parcel of what we do. Right. Slightly different to what you guys have been looking at here. There's an awful lot of growth planned in the higher education sector. In fact, we're looking at nearly half of the universities in England are looking to grow in the coming years. And I certainly know that Worcester is, is one of those looking for fairly substantial growth. Now that growth obviously is going to be buildings, facilities, sports grounds, accommodation. That has an impact. That's going to need to take up more land. And that is regulated through the planning process. So you've got this, this permitting system in place. Now where does biodiversity come in? There's quite a few policy drivers here that, that influence this. Firstly, um, we have a DEFRA strategy paper called Biodiversity 2020. Quite an ambitious target. They want to see no net loss of biodiversity by 2010. That's clearly all linked into the kind of stuff you guys are doing, but they want to see it delivered through the planning system. And if we're building stuff, we need to be careful about that. So, how does that kind of aspiration get filtered down into local plans? We have a national planning policy framework. Big document, lots of stuff in there. We'll focus on the relevant stuff. So it, it demands sustainable development, whatever that means. It also, crikey, look at this, it's 118 <coughs> before we actually get to some ecology there. So planning authorities should aim to enhance biodiversity. That's good. It doesn't tell us how to do it. 152. God, it does witter on this one. Um, if adverse effects are unavoidable, then compensatory measures can be used. So that's, that's an interesting, interesting concept. But we can see where the national policy and guidance is driving us. And all this then filters down to a local level into county plans, local plans, and, and their own policies at a kind of district level. So, no net loss of biodiversity. Crikey, how are we going to tackle that? It's an interesting one. Now, biodiversity offsetting was a concept discussed in the Environmental White Paper in 2011. It was closely followed by a government trial in 2012. Six authorities picked up on this trial, and it was voluntary. It was seen as voluntary for developers to pick up and deliver this. So it was a kind of mixed response, but certainly these guys like it so much, they're saying, actually, whether the government pushes this through or not, we like it. This is going to be one of our policies for delivering no net loss. So if you're developing in Warwickshire, Coventry and Solihull, you start to see this being requested as part of showing that your development is washing its own face. So you're starting to see these, these things come through. And I've certainly seen other districts asking for biodiversity offsetting calculations just so that they can have the reassurance that a scheme is, is, is doing what it says. 
There was also a DEFRA consultation paper, which September 2013, it got published last month. There's a lot of pie charts, and there's a, there's a few interesting things in there, but to be honest, it's, it's a bit underwhelming, so I didn't really bother uh, with it today. How it works, crikey. So, you've got a development site, so you establish a baseline. So Tim's little iPad comes in, because you're going to uh, establish what's there. You're then going to evaluate its worth, not financially, you're going to give it an ecological value, all those features within it, you're going to start to rank them. You're then, hopefully, going to be mindful of the mitigation hierarchy. So you're going to be embedded within the design team, you're going to be talking to them about constraints and opportunities, and then you can establish what the impacts are. Finally, get into the nitty gritty, offsetting calculation. So you can see where it all comes. That is really important because biodiversity offsetting shouldn't be seen as an excuse just to go ahead and develop good stuff. So it's really important you screen out and you design your site to avoid the good things. So ecological baseline, uh, this is a real phase one habitat map of a site down in Bracknell. So you, you go there, you map it, some of us still do it on paper, we'll, we'll speak to Tim later. Um, so you, you know exactly what's there, habitat-wise. You then evaluate it. The way we evaluate it in the industry is we look at it, we try and place it in a geographical context. So you've got international sites, national sites, normally these two are designated, regional, county sites, again they, they may have a designation. And then you might look at something that's district level importance or local level importance. So things that maybe haven't got a designation but they're quite good, they're going to enrich the local environment. And then you may drop right down to saying, well actually, that bit down here is not, not particularly special locally, but it's quite good on the site. So that's how we evaluate. And then from that, that point, we look at, we know where the good bits are, we've got to try and avoid them, we've got to try and influence the design to avoid, and if we can't, we're going to mitigate and then again, if we can't do that, we're going to look at compensation. So, when you have done all this, terrible little graph, uh, uh, table, but basically, you list your habitats, you know what area you've got, and then you can look at what the loss is, and you can quantify it. So it's just a numerical tabulation of what's, what's there and what's going to be lost. Biodiversity offsetting. The, the, the main principle about offsetting is, is giving a value to habitats and features. Now in this case, it's, it's a metric, fairly basic. You've got your habitat, you look at its distinctiveness. Now distinctiveness, strange word to use, but basically distinctiveness in this context is about its importance. So it's, it's rarity, it's level of diversity, <coughs> it's, it's value to biodiversity in general. So typically, woodlands, lowland meadows are high, improved grasslands are low. So you get the gist of, of where that scale is. It's a bit crude, but it's what we've got. Condition, again, poor, moderate, good, makes sense uh, as, as to how that works. In the trial, the poor, moderate, good has actually been using the countryside stewardship assessment methods. It's, it's pulled off the shelf, maybe not the best method, but it's a method. So, you know, there, there might be a bit of um, improvement there. Right, so calculating it all. Oh, that's a bit brutal. That's, that's kind of what you're faced with often. That's the uh, Warwickshire spreadsheet and there's several sheets there and there's all sorts of stuff and I think when we worked on this a couple of years back we were on version 17 of the spreadsheet and I'm sure it's been evolving since. I'm not going to bore you with that so this is a lot easier. So this, this is a calculation tool you can use. So pick your habitat first. If your habitat is something a little bit different that isn't listed 
you can manually input something and use your own judgments on distinctiveness and value and, and condition, sorry. So you've got number of hectares. So remember, we've measured all this. We know what habitats we've got. We've got area measurements. So number of um, hectares, its distinctiveness, its woodland, so it scores high. And it, it could, could be better, but it could be worse. So it's moderate. So 1.5 hectares has a value, a biodiversity unit of 18. So we've got a number now to that individual habitat. When we go to a, a site, this is from the phase one we saw earlier, you've, you can start to lay all this out and you get figures of, you can actually value the entire site. You can give it a value by, of biodiversity units, whatever they mean. Um, 139 biodiversity things, I call them. Um, and you can look at area lost, and then you can look at how many biodiversity things you're losing. So 41.21 bi biodiversity things are being impacted upon by this development. So this, this is where I've struggled for ages thinking, well, okay, it's a biodiversity unit. What, what does it look like to call it a biodiversity thing? It's kind of a new concept. So just for context, really nice stuff. Lowland meadow, good habitat. One hectare is worth 18 biodiversity units. You drop down the scale to improve grassland, and the same for arable land, and it's only two units per hectare. So you can kind of see that sliding scale, and those values will change depending on the condition of that habitat. So, you've worked out what your impact is. That development site, 41 biodiversity units, things, are going to be lost. So, how do we get those back? Right, okay. So, what we need to do is find another area of land, because we're going to offset. So, in this case, spelling mistake, if anyone wants to uh, spot that one. Um, is we're going to take some, some mixed deciduous woodland and it's in poor condition. It's unmanaged, it's in poor condition. So one hectare of poor condition woodland is worth six biodiversity things. We're then going to say, right, we're going to manage this and we're going to make it good. And at the end of making it good, it's going to be worth 18 biodiversity units. So you can see the concept is restoring woodland, you can actually increase its value in biodiversity units. The end product, now we can't count its existing value, so we, uh, we, we have to subtract that. So the, uh, the six comes off the 18. Now it does take time to actually uh, restore a woodland so in this case, we're restoring it. I'm saying it's going to be 10 years to get it up to the value we're seeking. But restoration is not that difficult. So it's quite low. So there's a few little calculations en route to uh, think about there. So the reality is we get an uplift of eight and a half biodiversity units. I might need more than two minutes, Seth. Um, so... For uh, one hectare of woodland restored, you get 8.5 units back. So, same again, let's plant it on an arable field. That might sound quite easy, but the reality is you're going to get less value because it's taken an awful lot longer and it's a bit more difficult to do to achieve that end goal. So that starts to put a bit of context as to how you need to think about this. So, your ideal strategy, careful design reduces the impact and loss and minimise what your losses are going to be. You can quantify which are the good bits and the bad bits. Keep the good stuff, look to restore and improve the higher value habitats, recreate habitats if you need to, and keep it on your estate. And I say that because I'll come on to that later. So here's an example. Uh, you can see this, this development was designed to fit in there. What we did do is we avoided the good bits. We threw a lot of management proposals at them 
and we recreated new habitats and at the end we've actually got an uplift in biodiversity uh, units there and uh, that really bought the favour of the, uh, the local ecologist in the council. It didn't buy the favour of the uh, planning committee though, so that one will not be uh, happening. So, not on your land. There's a broker system available. There is a company that's set up and has lodged itself in the councils that were part of the trial. They will take your money to find another site to deliver this. However, cost per unit is estimated at £5,000 and cost to offset one hectare of land, 30k a year. That's a big hefty lump sum. Developers might be okay with that because they can just take it off their, 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 their calculations at the end of the day. In planning terms, uh, certainly Warwickshire are looking to implement this for a 30 year lifespan. So you start to do those figures and it, it, it starts to look a bit more costly over time. So why is it relevant? Why is it relevant to you guys? Meeting planning policy needs. You're developing, you're growing, you want to meet those policy needs. It will get you that consent a little bit easier. That's a cynical view. CSR. Actually we're all here because we're trying to do the right thing and the best thing and I think there's a real possibility you can, you can deliver your growth in a responsible way. Practice what you preach. Wouldn't it be great to have your own systems up and running, a model that you can use and, and take your students to and, and, and talk about? Can you be a provider? Getting back to that figure where someone's getting £30,000 per, per annum to manage this. Actually, if you've got a big estate, you can actually start to become a provider. So there's, there's a potential income stream there. How does it integrate? You feed knowledge of resources and sensitivities into facilities management systems. I'm really keen, we've, we've, we've obviously got conflicts between university development aspirations, some of the facilities management. Well, if you feed it into GIS and BIM, Buildings Information Modeling, this is a new system which many of your places will be adopting for the built environment. You can start to feed it into the systems that your built, built environment guys are really comfortable with. So it starts to become something very real for them. Plan ahead. You, you know broadly what your plans are. You can start to appreciate what you've got. So you can start to plan which are the sensitivities, where have you got the areas where you would have minimal loss. You can double up on land use. Now this is really good because if you're clever enough, when they're developing a site, you can also get biodiversity credits from sustainable urban drainage, green infrastructure, recreational space. Not all of your campus will be developed. So get the most out of it, squeeze some out. And then integrate management and monitoring into state facility systems. We've, we've done biodiversity management plans for the likes of tarmac quarries and we integrated it into their EMS system which they're very rigid about enforcing. And through that, you get delivery of what your recommendations are. Try and make biodiversity something that fits into that built environment system because it will get taken notice of rather than being slightly separate. I think that's an important point. So summary, government's pushing for it. There's been a trial that's taken place, mixed results. Um, you can use it to show you're delivering on planning policy and CSR. Uh, it works well on large estates where you've got a long-term occupant. That's you guys. And you can join other blue chip companies, be self-sufficient, proactive and innovative. There are other companies looking at this. There's a, a large automotive business in the West Midlands which has a huge land holding, big growth plans, they're looking at this ahead of the game because they want to deliver this as part of their development package. And finally, conclusion is growth is possible whilst maintaining that no net loss of biodiversity. So thank you. That was quick.